Very fitting words for what we are here to celebrate this day, that we are not alone, that our God is a mighty God who saves, and we are here to surround uh, the Griffith family with our love and our prayers as we celebrate the life of a good and faithful servant in David Allen Griffith. Uh, the entire service is going to be projected, so you'll uh, be able to follow and sing along uh, with the words on the screen and the responses. Uh, I'm going to encourage you at the end of the service to, uh, to join us for a time of fellowship in our uh, Shepherd's Hall uh, after the service, so please do that. If you didn't get a chance to sign the guest book, you can do that uh, afterward as well. Uh, we celebrate an open communion here at the church, and as we celebrate that this day, we invite you to come forward and be a part of that uh, celebration. Uh, I'll, we'll go over that when we get to that point in, in the service. Uh, but. We're so grateful that all of you have gathered to, uh, to surround this family with prayer. I invite you to stand and join me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Thanks be to God. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Please join me in the opening hymn.
Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother David. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue with our readings. Uh, please, I just want to tell our ushers that we have plenty of seats over here to my left. A reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the eighth chapter. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. When I sat down to write my father's eulogy, I couldn't help 
but try and figure out his all-time favorite song, for music is something that me and him had a close bond together. He loved the Eagles, Tom Petty, CCR. He loved the song The Pretender by Jackson Brown, but I couldn't figure out what his all-time favorite song was. Well, I've been driving this car this week, and the only CD in the car is a band we discovered a few months ago. So as the last CD he bought, I think I've discovered his last favorite song. And we're gonna play that today. Back against the San Francisco traffic On the bridge's side the face is towards the jail Setting out to join a demographic He hoists his first leg up over the rail Phone calls made police cars show up quickly And the sergeant slams his passenger door He says, hey son, why don't you talk through this with me Just tell me what you're doing it for Oh, it's a little bit of everything. It's the mountains, it's the fog. It's the news at six o'clock. It's the death of my first dog. It's the angels up above me. It's the song that they don't sing. It's a little bit of everything. There's an older man who stands in the buffet line. He is smiling and holding out his plates. And the further that he looks back into his timeline, that hard road always led into today. He's making up for when his bright future had left him He's making up for the fact his only son is gone And letting everything out once his server asks him Sir, have you figured out yet what it is you want? I want a little bit of everything the biscuits and the beans Whatever helps me to forget about these things that brought me to my knees Pal on those mashed potatoes And how about an extra chicken wing Cause I'm having a little bit of everything She 
said you just worry about your groomsmen and your shirt size. And rest assured that this is making me feel good. I think that love can be so much easier than we realize. You can give yourself to someone than you should. Cause it's a little bit of everything The way you choke, the way you ache It's getting up before you So I can watch you as you wake So on that day in late September It's not some stupid little ring But getting a little bit of everything Oh, it's a little bit of everything. It's the matador and the bull. It's the suggested daily dosage. It's the red moon when it's full. All these psychics and all these doctors, they're all right and they're all wrong. It's like trying to make out every word when we should just sing along. It's not some message written in the dark or some truth that no one sees. It's a little bit of everything. Um, before I start, um, I can't tell you how much your presence here uh, for my mom, my two brothers, and our family, it means to us. The messages, the food, the, you know, everything that's happened this past week, um, you guys are our little angels, and uh, we, we truly, truly appreciate it from the bottom of our heart. How are you? Thank you. Be careful. I'm proud of you. I love you. Five simple yet powerful statements. For those of you here and those of you that could not be here today, there's a good chance that you heard one of these statements at some point in my father's life in a very special way. How are you? Again, simple in concept. However, when my father spoke to you, it was typically after a warm hug or during a handshake in which he would grab a hold of your hand, look you square in the eye, and make you feel what he was saying. If you were distracted, he would squeeze just a bit harder and wait until you locked eyes with him so that he knew the message was received. Why did he do this? Well, he cares for and has love for each and every one of you. And he wanted to be absolutely sure that you got the message. He wanted to know how you were doing sincerely. Dad, consider the message received. His handshake, wow, his handshake. If you closed your eyes while it was happening, you could convince yourself that you're putting your hand in a vice as it slowly crushed your bones. <laughs> and then after opening your eyes, you'd see that it was all 5'7", 130 pounds of David Allen Griffith, just giving you that extra effort to show you that he cared. He made you feel it. Dad, we all felt your love. A small package, and yet so large in character, and some very, very important traits. I will name a short few of my favorite and most compelling traits of my father. The words, thank you, my father was gracious. There was no amount of effort, gift, thought, favor, or praise that was too small or meaningless for dad. He appreciated each and everything and afforded his, in his life. Humble, the man never boasted of himself unless it was in reference to his three sons was prideful, however, never put himself above others in his accomplishments. The only area in which he wasn't so humble was his affiliation with his favorite sports teams, Florida State Seminoles, Pittsburgh Pirates, Pittsburgh Penguins, 
and last but not least, yes, the black and gold, the Pittsburgh Steelers. These, organ these organizations truly walked on water, according to Dad, and I certainly won't have a crossword otherwise, as I know who my audience is today, and I'm slowly learning when it's a good time to just, well, shut up and smile. <laughs> loyal, loyal to his wife, loyal to his three sons, and loyal to all friends and colleagues. Dad was with you until the bitter end, no matter how steep the challenge, no, no matter how many easy way outs available. Dad was thorough, painfully thorough. In both professional and personal realms of his life, the man never cut corners. The man never completed anything to less than 100%. This is the trait that I challenge everyone here, especially my two brothers and my mother, to follow. Life does not end today. The task is not over today. We must continue to be thorough in all of our doings on this earth until we join Dad in heaven. How are you? Thank you. Be careful. I am proud of you. I love you. Be careful. Stemming from both his love of his family and a career in crisis management and emergency preparedness, Dad did his best to instill in his three sons the art of caution. From childhood to present day, speaking also for Corbin and Ethan, we can recall doing double takes when about to engage in a dangerous activity. Why? Because whether we liked it or not, we all remember Dad saying those words, be careful, accompanied by that vice grip handshake and stern eye to eye contact. Although we did not always heed his advice, it definitely saved the three of us from doing additional damage in our lives. I mean, have you met our friends? He did his best to play protective of the family, even getting up in the middle of countless important work meetings to answer his cell phone. If he saw it was one of his three boys or his wife, he would answer and say, everything okay? If he said yes, he'd quickly tell you he was in the middle of a meeting and that he would catch up with you later. It didn't matter how important the meeting was or who was in attendance, our family's well-being was his number one priority. Just take a second and imagine this. A hurricane briefing downtown at FEMA headquarters. Cell phone rings. Glaring eyes all around the room focused on Dad. He stands up. Yes, sorry, Mr. President. I have to take this. It's my son, and I need to make sure he's OK. Uh, that's my dad, and it meant the world to us. I am proud of you. As with all the other statements, I heard them often, and I heard them sincerely. But this notion always struck me as the most important to Dad. What was incredible to me was how consistently others described his pride of his family. It's undeniable when you hear it from everyone you know that the first thing they would say about dad is how proud he was of his three sons. He shined in the glory of knowing his three sons were on the right track in all areas of their lives. And in fact, he waited until we reached major milestones in our lives to leave us. He glowed at Ethan and Danielle's wedding and the pinning ceremony at Ethan's graduation into the Metropolitan Police Department. He glowed at Corbin's educational achievements at Virginia Tech, his recent initiation into the Homeowners Club with his wonderful girlfriend, Jen, and a career path that has senior leadership written all over it. And for me, well, Mom described the scene at Morton Plant Hospital in Clearwater, Florida, hours after I was born. Dad, easily the smallest guy in the room, stood chest out, arms crossed, that nine pound, 10 ounce lug of a baby, yeah, I did that. <laughs> and I guess he was also proud of my career. Uh, just before the holiday break, he was able to visit my first true personal office. Four walls, a door and a window. Uh, this office, also known as the Dojo, or Center for Insurance Learning, uh, made him very proud as he told me, man, you're doing it. I'm so, so proud of you. Lastly, he waited patiently by his phone the night of December 19th of this past year to hear me say the words, she said, yes, Dad, I'm so, so happy. My father couldn't be more proud that I was now going to marry an exceptionally beautiful, caring, loving young woman, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, he loved you like his own daughter. From the minute he met you and welled up with pride that you were a music teacher, just like his dad, my late grandfather, Robert Griffith. His three sons are on the road to success in their careers in large 
part to three principles that he instilled in us, or as I call them, the three Ps. Be punctual. Never, ever be late for anything. Do not ever believe your time is more important than those you are meeting. Be prepared. Respect those you are meeting by being prepared with your content. Take extra time to make sure you do not stop progress due to your lack of preparedness. Be presentable. Know your audience. Dress appropriately. Have good hygiene. And when you shake someone's hand, look them dead in the eye and give them that extra squeeze to let them know, know that they're working with a Griffith man. I love you. This is the easiest statement to describe. There's not one day in my 30 years, 31 years on this earth that I have not felt the love of my father. Constant verbal reminders, always sincere and never cheaply mentioned. Always with meaning, always undistracted, and of course, he would make sure you got the message. That's right, vice grip, eye contact, you get the picture. He loved his three sons intensely, and he loved his beautiful wife, my hero in my world, Deborah Griffith, relentlessly. He never stopped loving. He never took breaks loving. He did not love when it was convenient. He loved all the time, whether you wanted it or not. And lastly, he loved all of you. As I conclude my thoughts, may I now address my father. How are you? Thank you. Be careful. I'm proud of you. I love you. How are you, Dad? Are you happy? Don't worry about us. You've prepared us, and we are strong. I will take care of Mom and my brothers, I promise. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for always making us the focal point in your life. Thank you for every single selfless word, touch, and second of your presence on this earth. Be careful, Dad. Be careful to not forget that we still need you. We need you to walk with us through this life. We need you to join us in the memories to come. We need you to point us in the right direction, and we need to feel your presence from now until we join you in heaven. I am proud of you, Dad. I am so proud of you for touching so many lives. You touched my life in such a special way. I'm sorry, Dad, but you could never be as proud as I am standing here thinking of you. And I love you, Dad. I love you with everything that I am, everything that I will be. I'll talk to you soon, Pops. Love your oldest son, Chad. Imagine life is a game in which you are juggling five balls. The balls are called work, family, health, friends, and integrity. And you're keeping all of them in the air. But one day you finally come to understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will come back. The four other balls are made of glass. And if you drop one of these, it will be irrevocably scuffed, nicked, or perhaps even shattered. And once you truly understand the lesson of the five balls, you will have the beginning of balance in your life. This was a quote my dad had, had written down in his desk drawer and read to his sons often. Thank you for coming. My name is Corbin Allen Griffith, proud son of David Allen Griffith. I'm extremely proud to stand before you here today and convey these great things about my dad. Selfless. My dad never thought of himself. Everything he did, he did for his family. Out of his long list of priorities, he was never on there. He was on there for his personal health, but I'm confident he took care of his health so he could live a long life and take care of his family. My dad was very thoughtful. If he were to stumble on an article, no matter how stupid it was, if it, reminded him, if it reminded him of somebody, he would cut it out, track you down, and make sure you read it. Loving. Look at my mom. He filled her life every day with unconditional love. 
He looked at her every day like the little girl he met over 40 years ago. He touched so many people's lives with his love. And I know a lot of people loved him, but I'm confident he always gave more love than he received. Organized and prepared, he saw life through his daytimer. There is not a single blank page on 30 years of his daytimers. Every day was filled with a task or a reminder, whether that was changing the oil in his car, changing the air filters, calling a friend, calling a relative. Oh, call it preparedness, super organized, you could call it OCD. <laughs> he kept a written check ledger and saved every receipt. I didn't think people still did that. <laughs> he never let anything slip through the cracks, ever. Every Christmas we were given something to prepare us. One year we got a toolbox, this year we got a snow shovel. But there was a few years sprinkled in there where he actually gave us an emergency response kit complete with heat blankets, MREs, flares, you name it. <laughs> we haven't opened them, but we still have them. He made sure our family was prepared, and he prepared us for this day. Everything was written down and organized for us. He left my mom in great shape. I've been driving his car this week, and he left me a full tank of gas. A newly washed and waxed car, even a box of tissues in the center console, which has come in very handy. I think it's safe to say that my dad touched many people's lives by the turnout today. Even if you met him once in passing, I truly, I truly believe he left you feeling better because he was filled with God's love. His family was very lucky to have spent many years with him. Here are a few things that he left us. For my older brother, Chad, he left you with his strength. Even through tough times, my dad showed strength and comforted our family that we would be okay. As a kid, I never knew we went through hard times because he wouldn't allow us to fear. I never saw him scared. Chad has been our rock this week, and I will always reach out to him for wisdom, advice, and my father's strength. My little brother Ethan, my younger brother Ethan, he left, you, he left you with compassion. Ethan cares so much about his family and friends. You wouldn't see it if you didn't know him well, but he's a very emotional guy. He's a great example of my dad's love, and it's wonderful to see Ethan grow in his compassion for others. My mom. He left my mom with everything she ever wanted. He provided her with security, many beautiful homes, and gave her so much love. He left her three great men, all demonstrating his love, and we will continue to live by his example. Me, my whole life, ever and always said that I was a spitting image of my father. I looked like him, I act like him, and he passed on many of his traits, both good and bad. I'm controlling, I'm meticulous, I'm stubborn. But you know, he also left me with a great musical ability, a great sense of purpose and drive, and thousands of random tidbits of random facts. <laughs> I could tell you the last name of the drummer on that rock band in the 60s who had one hit, all the way to little facts about the history of our family lineage. My dad lost his father around this age, and he always reminded us that his father was the greatest man and that he would never be as good as him. I sometimes feel the same way. Of his 62 years, I, tru I truly believe this past year has been one of the fullest for my dad. My dad and three of his closest friends from high school were able to get together in Ocean City this summer the FFE, the Fearsome Foursome Enterprises, Jim Mapes, Bill Kesson, Greg Zarifos, and my father. This past year, my father got to watch my little brother marry his wife, Danielle. He got to see Chad get engaged with his future wife, Elizabeth. He saw my mother start a wonderful job with the Kellogg Collection. 
I spent a lot of time with my father this past year, more than most. In fact, I was able to spend time with him on his last day. He got to meet my beautiful girlfriend. My beautiful and amazing girlfriend, I got to meet her parents. The two of us went to a Steelers game and watched many more on TV, just the two of us together. We went to see one of his favorite bands, Trombone Shorty, at the 930 Club, and my ears still hurt from that night. <laughs> he helped me on many projects at my new home this past year, which he was extremely proud to be a part of. However, I'd say the most rewarding experience of this past year when, when my father asked me to help him work on his car. For the countless times my father had helped me, it was a great experience to lend a helping hand and help him. I will leave you all with this thought. For those who want to spend a little bit more time with my father, I encourage you to spend time with my mom, myself, and my brothers, for he left plenty of himself in us. Thank you.
Good afternoon. No. Chad, we probably should have uh, looked at each other's speeches because I use kind of the same example of his selflessness, but we'll go ahead with it anyways. Um, and also, there was a video that I was going to share after my speech, um, but we're having some technical difficulties uh, getting it up before the service. So, Penny, we're just going to go ahead and leave that out. Um, but uh, again, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, I know my dad, he's smiling ear to ear right now, seeing all these people gathered together. Um, I wore this uniform just a few weeks ago to Christmas Eve service here at Good Shepherd uh, to honor the NYPD officers who were assassinated just days before Christmas. But I wear this uniform today because my father was the man who pinned my badge to my uniform at my graduation just six or seven months ago on August 1st. This was one of the most important and special moments in my life, but it was even more so for my father. It wasn't easy for him, because he was nervous of the profession I so badly wanted to join. He knew the dangers of the job and the stress it puts on families. But he pushed all the doubt out of the way because he believed I was equipped to perform the duties of the job. He also knew the woman I married would be strong enough to endure the rigors of the job. And speaking of the woman I married, Danielle, you can take that daughter-in-law tag off and throw it away. You were his daughter, his first and only one, and he loved you very, very much. He knew how happy you made me, and that's what he always wanted, was to watch me live a life full of happiness. I don't know who was more excited that day when I officially became a sworn law enforcement officer, my father and myself. And that is what made my father so special. His selflessness. All he cared about was his family being happy and being successful. But that's just one example of my dad showing the kind of man he was. He always stood up for his family and he did everything in his power to make sure they were successful. Humble, caring, responsible, organized. The list of words to describe my father could go on forever. But the most important trait that I want people to remember about my father was his selflessness. No matter what was going on in his own personal life, his family would always come first. This man would be in government meetings with very high-ranking officials, military generals, government employees, even on one occasion with President Obama. But he would step out every time if any one of his sons or wife called him. I mean, he could have gotten into a lot of trouble for stuff like that. But he would answer the phone and say, Ethan, is everything all right, bud? I would respond, yeah, just had a few questions to ask you, or I need some help with something. And he would say this, I'm so glad you're safe and all right, but I really need to get back to work. I'll call you when I'm free. As long as he knew I was safe and all right, he knew he could get back to work. But he would have no trouble walking out on the president to come help his family. He just wanted to make sure I wasn't in danger. His family always came before anything else. My father worked a very stressful job. But as a kid growing up, I wouldn't have ever known it. He never used work as an excuse to be disgruntled or upset. My dad would always come home with a smile on his face. He would hang up his jacket, put away his briefcase, and walk into the kitchen for dinner. He would kiss my mother, hug his three sons, and listen to the stories from our day. After dinner, he would help me and my brothers with our homework and tuck us into bed every night. Little did I know as a kid that when we were asleep, he would be back down in his office to finish his own work. And he came to all of my sporting events, no matter what time he was scheduled to get off of work that day. He took such great pride in watching his sons compete in sports. He took such great pride in watching his sons grow and mature into men. My father sacrificed everything in his life 
to watch his son succeed. When people pass away, many people have the response of, this is unfair, or how could you ever do this to me, God? This thought never crossed my mind, never. When I watched my father pass away, all I could do was thank God. Thank him that my father was here with me for 25 years. Thank, my, thank God that my dad did not suffer and that he fell asleep peacefully. To thank God that my dad watched me marry the love of my life. To thank God my dad watched me graduate high school and college. And as a lot of you might have known me as a kid, that was probably a pretty unreasonable task. I was a little crazy as a kid growing up. But he was very proud. To thank God, I got to spend New Year's Eve with my father the day before he passed. Just a few hours before the ball dropped and my wife and I left for a New Year's Eve party, he gave me a hug and a kiss. He said, I don't know how you're gonna top off 2014. You got the career you wanted, the woman you wanted, you got a beautiful new home, but I hope 2015 can be better. Um, and again, uh, I just wanted to thank God that my dad was always there to assist me in life. And to thank God for giving me my best friend for those 25 years. He was the man I went to for advice in times of need my father was always there for me, no matter what. Like I said earlier, the list would go on forever for all the great things my father did for me and my family. All the things he taught me. So again, I just want to say thank you, Pops, for all you did for me. Continue to watch over me and protect me from heaven. Thank you. David, you did good. You raised three amazing, amazing young men. My name is Sandy Redmond. David and Debbie Griffith have been dear friends for 30 years. Chad, Corbin, and Ethan, you truly are amazing young men. To watch you care for your dear mother has been a treasure for me. I love you so much, but now please, if you will allow me, I'm mostly going to talk to your mom. I understand a little bit of what she's going through. Many years ago, I lost my first husband, suddenly and tragically. His name was Dennis Crouch, and I miss him dearly to this day. From that experience, I learned three things. Three things I want you to hold on to. Number one, hold on to your faith. Number two, hold on to your family. Not going to be a problem there. And number three, hold on to your friends. That's also not going to be a problem. <laughs> hold on to your faith. How wonderful to know that without question, David's salvation is certain. He's in heaven singing in the choir, and would he not have loved that beautiful song that this choir sang for him? Thank you so much. David is singing next to his dad, and he's worshiping with the angels. Two weeks after Dennis died, I was sitting in this church for the first time. Nobody knew me. I didn't know anybody else. But within a very, very short period of time, I was surrounded by pastors, by church members. They offered me comfort and the love of Christ like I'd never known it before. Many of them are here today. 
today are also going to be here for you, as are many, many others. Guess what, Debbie? 30 years ago, you were one of my angels. Hold on to your faith, Deb. As you go through the shock of losing this dear man, it's okay to cry out to God. I did this often. I wanted to know why. I'm glad you're so comfortable with that, Ethan. It's an awesome, awesome gift that you have. Tears are okay, not just today, but next week, next month, next year, any time they flow. Jesus wept. He knows pain, he knows grief. Hold on to Jesus and know that he's with you as you struggle to get through the day. Read and study his word. The verses are gonna mean more to you now in some, some ways than they ever were before. I know you like devotionals. A recent devotional I read had this verse from Matthew. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. The time has come for you, Debbie. This is a hard thing. Don't hesitate to cry out for support because God has promised he'll never leave us or forsake us. Hold on to Jesus because I promise you he's holding on to you. Friends. After Dennis's death, I learned the importance of friends. Hold on to your friends and know without a doubt you're not bothering us. You're not bothering us, Deb. If you call me five times a day, seven days a week, midnight, 3 a.m., 7 a.m., you're not waking me up. Well, maybe you will, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Call me. I will rush to your house. You can come to my house anytime. This past week, as I watched your sons and sisters take care of you and protect you as best as they could, your friends, you were working in the background. Candy, Carol, and Diane, Debbie, and I, we've been praying for you and your whole family, and we've been doing our best to help you and your boys to, by easing the load. That's what friends do for each other. This is our time to come around you. Your Fab 50 friends love you as sisters, and we're going to be there for the long haul. Family. Hold on to that family of yours. You're blessed with an incredibly close and loving family. And many of you may not know, but there was an absolute miracle and blessing that came not that long ago. There was a healing of a relationship, relationships within that family. And it was for such a time as this. Pam and Sandy are the dearest sisters, and they are going to be there for you. Pam, I'm going to remember what you said. She's going to learn to make the drive down on her own so she can come and spend time with her loving and wonderful sister. David was so proud of the men his three boys became, as evidenced by their faith, their family values, and their strong work ethic. A big highlight in David's life recently was his beautiful daughter, Danielle, his soon-to-be daughter, Liz, and beautiful Jen. Debbie said when, whenever David would see a baby girl or a girl, he would just change because he always wanted a daughter. You guys gave him these beautiful gifts. And he loved it, smiled from ear to ear. Debbie, as long as I've known you, you've always put David first. I can't remember how many times. We want to do this. Well, I can't because David this. Because David this. I'm, David needs me to do this. David and I are going to the lake. David came first. He was always number one. The two of you together worked so well. He knew when to put his foot down. And you knew how to talk things out. That's so important. She say we talk it out. We, get, we discuss it. We get through it. We talk it out. You loved him unconditionally and you respected him. And you did so many things just because he wanted you to. I wish I could tell you, Deb, it's not going to be difficult. But I can't. It's going to be tough. You've lost the love of your life, the sweet man who cherished you for over 40 years, the father of your children, the man who laid next to you in bed. He leaves a void that's impossible to fill. Debbie, you were there for me 30 years ago. 
please let me be there for you. I love you, my dear sweet friend, and I loved David Griffith. Faith, family, and friends. That's how David lived, and that's how you get through things. Hold on to all of them. And know, this is something I know so deeply. Jesus welcomed David into his arms, and he said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. In you, I am well pleased. I'm going to invite you to stand, get on your feet, and we'll read the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The gospel of the Lord. I'm going to do it this moment. I'm going to just invite us to, uh, to share the peace. Uh, it seems to me at this point we should just stay on our feet for a moment, but uh, greet those around us with the word of peace and uh, give a hug. We'll take it whatever time we need. You may be seated. You know, it, it probably seems fitting that uh, someone from Pittsburgh gets to speak. <laughs> so I, I don't have to apologize. Um, maybe I should, but... Uh, I think I could have been the worst pastor in the world, but I at least had instant credibility because I loved all Pittsburgh teams my entire life. <laughs> but um, I learned that David's favorite player growing up, his entire childhood, was a guy named Roberto Clemente. Wonderful player, one of the greatest of all time. And when so essentially David's entire childhood would have seen Clemente playing, but when David was 20 probably home on Christmas uh, break from college, probably with Debbie the night this happened, but uh, Clemente died en route to deliver aid to earthquake victims in Nicaragua when his plane went down. He was an incredible player, but really I think what inspired people was he was just an incredible humanitarian. And I, I, I would would love to have asked David is how, how, did, how much did Clemente really inspire you as a humanitarian, as someone who thought of others. Uh, to this day, probably the most prestigious award, in my opinion, for all Major League Baseball players is the Roberto Clemente Award for being a humanitarian. He was continually giving back, giving of himself to better others, to bless those people especially who were facing crisis. And what I think we could say about his life was it was a life well lived, a life that inspired, and tragically, he was gone too soon. And we certainly could say that 
same exact thing about David. Life well lived, a life that inspired, and tragically gone too soon. One of the most important things, one of the things we talk a lot about in this church, and David was a member here for over 30 years, is the important saying, all the baptized people of God are ministers. It's not just the people who wear a collar, who hold the title pastor. All Christians are ministers in daily life. All of you are, serve God with what you are given. And the calling of a Christian is to use what God has given you to help others, to be a blessing in the world around you and be a good steward of that gift. And I would say David was an incredible steward of that gift. People might not have said what he did in daily life was ministry, but I do. What he did was an incredible, incredible witness. You, I, I did some Googling. Uh, where, you know, you like to say you turn to Bible for all your answers, but you do turn to the Google every once in a while. <laughs> and I forget exactly what my search was, but it led me to a, an article 34 years ago. David was probably 27 years old at the time, but it was about uh, this, it was in the Tampa Bay newspaper saying, uh, David Griffith has come up with this hurricane plan for the entire region. It was a fascinating article about uh, the goal was to eliminate guesswork about hurricanes. Uh, and for me, there's a lot of guesswork that's involved when a hurricane hits. Uh, but it essentially was about saying David was one of the people who said, if this happens, then we mobilize the forces to do this. If this happens, we do this plan. And it was a whole a tremendous number of different scenarios, but it was thinking through everything, imagining what public servant, public safety people should be doing, where we would go for food, where we would do, where we would uh, help, where help could be if it, if it was in this community. Uh, I don't know what you were doing at 27 years old, but I don't think I could have mobilized a region to do such a thing. His job and his mentality was to think ahead certainly in his work, but also in his life, because we know that storms, hurricanes, but even more important, disruptive events happen to all of us, spiritually, emotionally, sometimes literally, but all of us know disruption. I've known David as a person of faith. Many of the people in the room know David as a person of deep faith. For me, he was a Christian brother who supported me on my journey of faith, supported the people behind me on a journey of faith, supported so many of you out there by his faithful encouragement. And I have no doubt that several years ago when he went through that stroke, that faith and, his, and the prayers of many were a great encouragement to him and lifted him up. You know, I, I usually read the story from John 14 where Jesus says, Behold, I go and prepare a place for you usually read that at the sermon, at, at a funeral. I, I just love this story too much that I think David would have wanted us to hear this story of, uh, of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And what, what's significant is it's, it's a story that's told in the present tense. And theologically, what that means is saying, this isn't just a past event where the disciples honor a boat on a boat. It's saying all of us are in that boat. And we are called to imagine a horrible, horrible storm. We're called to imagine that we are being overwhelmed, we are losing heart, we're questioning what's going on. And like the disciples, some of us in the room may be saying, don't you care, Jesus? You're asleep. He's in the back of the boat, sound asleep. But you know, I, was I think about David, and we've all heard these stories of uh, being prepared, isn't that a wonderful image, though? The best preparation is to have Jesus in the boat with you, first and foremost. He's in the boat. He's in the position where usually you would steer, give direction. And ultimately, even if we're thinking he's asleep in a moment's notice, he is there ready to save. And that really is what we celebrate this day, is that Jesus has saved David has embraced him, and he is reaching out this day to embrace all of us. What he does in that story is it says he st stands up and he commands, he rebukes the world around him to be calm, to offer peace, and offer hope 
in the midst of that great difficulty. And that's what Jesus does to us. He offers us healing and wholeness this day, and he offered David the ultimate healing this day. And in all the days to come, we celebrate the fact that he is with the Lord. You know, it was a, uh, a tough moment. Tough moment, we know, on uh, January 1 and uh, into the early hours of January 2, as the family gathered at the hospital, Chad texted me and said, Dad's not going to make it. Please come. And it was, a, it was really a thing of beauty, ultimately, because it filled in that hospital room, as we said goodbye to David, as we co- said a prayer commending him to God's almighty care, there was that incredible sense of gratitude. You know, it, it's a always a difficult moment to to bid someone in your life farewell, but what they did was beautiful. They hugged him, they embraced him, they said out loud what what they wanted to say to David, and in a sense, they were the first people ultimately welcoming him to heaven. When When he gave his final breath, ultimately we turned him to God forever, and we celebrate you know, one of the songs Debbie wanted us to sing, I don't know if we know it, I don't know if Peter, I, I, throw, I always throw things at him at the last moment. Debbie uh, and, and David sang in the choir, uh, All God's Critters Got a Place in the Choir is one of her favorites. Do you know that one? All God's Critters Got a Place in the Choir, some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Of course, but all Welshmen can sing, and we know that. (laughs) So the words are, all God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire, and something, something, something. (laughs) You got the point. We're all part of the choir. Some just clap along. So let's just do one verse. For this. Amen. Does that work for you? All right. Maybe not as in tune, but uh, David was an important part of our Christian community here, and uh, we're so grateful that you have all gathered here. Reach out in the days to come. My Uh, It's it's very, very important that you do that and tell the stories. It need not be today. Years to come, you can do that. Uh, But um, we, we celebrate the goodness of God this day. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I invite you to stand as you are able for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to all your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Grant us grace to entrust David to your never-failing love which sustained him in this life. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and remember him according to the favor you bear for your people. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So the gifts of God for the people of God. The congregation may be seated. So I said at the beginning, we invite all of you to, uh, to come forward and share in the communion meal. Uh, if you'd like a blessing, please just indicate that to Ann or myself. Uh, you'll come to the front aisle. We'll have uh, a bread right, right in front of you. Right next to us is a cup of wine. You'll take your wafer and dip it into the cup of wine.
please stand. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant David. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn.